I guess on a personal level. I was working for General Motors years ago and I had my family on vacation. I took my kids to Disney World in Florida and we heard on the radio that it, there was going to be a shuttle launch. So we looked into it and found out and we went down to the beach and it was like going to a rock concert basically. Those were the days of people having boom boxes and everybody did the countdown on the beach. And as it turned out, it was the in, initial maiden voyage of the Challenger. And just a few years later, I was working down in Florida, working for Pratt Whitney. And uh, unfortunately, I did see the demise uh, out the window of the second store building with all my coworkers uh, of the Challenger disaster. I, w I was very uh, remorseful to the whole situation. And uh, I guess that's the key, key thing that keeps me driving uh, in, in the passion of the uh, shuttle program. I'm getting goosebumps. Um, <laughs> my first engine test was at Canoga Park um, up on the up on the hill at Santa Susana, and the shock waves that came off the engine, the power that came off of our engines was so amazing. It just filled me with an excitement that I I can't even. I can't even share with you in words because it, it, you have to feel it. And I felt that when I've been at every SSME launch and it's never changed. I think it has a major effect on, on how you look at the job that you have to do. I'm still filled with excitement and energy and that's what's important here. Uh, to support shuttle, you have to be energized and you have to be motivated to do that that job just the best that you very best you can. And one of the things that stand out in my mind when we first ran our fuel pumps, the uh, gases that went through the turbine was exhausted through a orifice that was ignited and put a big flame out the side of the uh, hot gas manifold and then the, the hydrogen that was pumped went up a stack and they actually had to call uh, Palm Beach International Airport every time we ran and reroute commercial traffic around the area when we were going to do our runs. And I was pretty amazed about that, that the, the heat from the, from the running could go that high to possibly interrupt a commercial flight. A group of us were at KSC and we ha had the good fortune to visit the Columbia room where they store the recovered artifacts from the Columbia accident. Well, our group was in the VAB waiting on our tour guide to arrive and we were all just kind of standing around talking, laughing and joking around and the mood was very light. Uh, when our tour guide arrived and took us to the artifacts room, she opened the door and you could have heard a pin drop. Uh, as we saw the displays. Uh, it was a very somber, very quiet moment uh, and uh, I think the magnitude of the tragedy really sank in with all of us. And I think, you know, together we've all done some wonderful, awesome things working main engine and, and working on the space shuttle program and so we celebrate those things but at the same time, we're very mindful of the sacrifices that some extremely courageous people have made throughout the entire history of NASA to get us where we are today. And we will always uh, remember and honor that. I think the most memorable time in my career working on SSME was in the early 90s when we had uh, the on-pad aborts that we had. We had uh, actually four of them within the span of two or three years. And I had been an engineer at the company for four or five years when those happened, so I was just getting my feet wet. Long hours and you spend uh, a lot of time, you learn a lot is what I'm trying to say. And uh, those experiences working for those ab aborts, um, when the eyes of the world were on you, uh, that's something that's pretty memorable to me.
I came to SSME in around December 2005. So the first launch that I saw working for SSME was in December 2006. My husband and I took vacation and took both of our mothers and a lot of our great nieces and nephews down for the launch. So we were out in the causeway and it was a night launch. Oh, it was fantastic. It was beautiful. And as, as the, you know, after the launch and you're watching it, you're going to watch it as long as you can. And it's so exciting. And um, so then the, uh, the guy comes over the intercom and says, three main engines operating nominal. And I'm going, woo hoo woo -hoo. And then the launch goes out of sight. And my great nephew came up to me and patted me on the shoulder and said, good job, Annalisa. And, you know, to me, um, just fantastic. In the 80s, uh, we had a major engine incident and we were supposed to fly nine days later. And we literally worked around the clock to make sure that we could clear that engine. And we had different failure scenarios that we were working. We didn't know exactly what it was, but we had to make sure for any of those failure scenarios that were possible that the next flight was not going to experience that same problem. So that's one of those fire drill memories that you have. Uh, the other memories are just, I love working with the folks around here, you know, just working with true rocket scientists, you know, people that are experts in their field, passionate about what they do, really dedicated to keeping astronauts safe. We get to, to talk with astronauts and, and get to know them. Uh, so that's just kind of a day-to-day -day pleasure to work here and the, and the folks we get to work with. I think uh, the, the, one of the saddest memories that I have is when uh, we decided to move engine assembly out of Canoga Park. Uh, it was a business decision at that time and it was a good decision to do it because we weren't building that many more engines. But uh, one memory we had is we took a picture of it and we were all waving goodbye to the engine as it was uh, the last engine that left the engine line. So uh, that, that's one of the sad memories that I had of, of the engine line. But there's tons and tons of other good memories of uh, successful launches and great accolades for everyone that have done good things here at Rocketdyne. So there's a, there's a whole archive of, of good memories uh, across the board. I had a recent experience um, that I think was really pretty special to me. It changed some of my perspective. I took a class in ground operations for the shuttle at KSC. And of course, during this class, they're talking about the whole flow from the day a shuttle lands and all the steps that they go through to get it ready to launch again. And they have schedules literally down to 15 minute increments during the flow of everything that has to happen to that shuttle. And in all of these flows, there's just this little tiny part about the SSME. And it basically is a little block that says, install SSME or remove SSME. And I kept thinking, wait a minute, we're like the most important thing on the orbiter. Why are they only spending a couple little bars on all these flow charts? And after about three days of this, I finally figured out, you know why we aren't showing up on that? Because we are always there ready to support. Our hardware is ready. The folks doing the flow at KSC, they don't even have to think about the SSME because they know we are going to be there ready to support. Yeah, we're the SSME. We're there. We're supporting our customer and they don't even have to think about us. I remember when I was a little kid, probably about 12 years old, and I was excited about the space program. I remember writing a letter to NASA and I didn't, I don't know what I wrote, but I think it was along the lines of Dear NASA, please send me stuff. And I remember getting an envelope back from them, a big old brown envelope. And for all I knew at that time, it was sent to me by John Glenn himself. And I opened it up and it was pictures of uh, the Apollo 8 uh, program and the, the decal about circling the moon and circling the earth with the big eight. And that's truly why I got excited about the space program. I remember the excitement that I felt, and admittedly I was probably only 11 or 12 years old, but that really had an impact on me, and at that point in time I decided, hey, I want to be part of something bigger, and I thought the space program, you can't get any bigger than that. And that's why I'm here today.
starting here at the, at the test stands, they had the burn stacks, and you get the burn stacks going first. And, and the, the flame, the hydrogen flame that would shoot into the air, 5,000 feet. A lot of the tests were late at night. It seemed like you got things done during the day and tested at night. That's historically true for anybody. But you were so close, you could feel the heat. And then uh, right before the, the, uh, the start sequence would be enabled, uh, the valves would start to creak, ice would start to fall, and you, that, that sense of what's going to happen next just built. And then when the uh, pump lit off, uh, the roar, the sound, it was just incredible it, to be so close and so much power. At the end of the day, when I walk away from the Space Shuttle Main Engine Program, one of their most memorable or rewarding parts of working on the program were the people that they worked with. There's not a lot of people in the world that have the opportunity to work on rocket engines, and so you become very close. I think when you leave uh, SSME or leave or retire, you're going to miss the people the most. I always remember one time I decided to take my wife to a launch, and I decided I would just enjoy the launch with my wife, and so we were at the, um, the viewing area on, on the Banana River. And, and I remember that, you know, I was on the cell phone constantly with the guys in the uh, launch control room asking them for data, and they would feed me numbers and ask questions, and we went back and forth, and, and finally the launch went off right on time, which was uh, kind of special in those days. And, and I always remember we were sitting in this large grandstand of people and uh, you know everybody was cheering and yelling as the shuttle took off and then when you finally couldn't see it anymore everybody started leaving. Of course we were sitting there still glued on my cell phone because uh, the shuttle engines were still firing and, and by the time we hit Miko my wife and I were the only ones sitting in the grandstand Everybody else was left and was already partying, I guess, at that time. But, uh, you know, it was always special, uh, those missions to hit Miko. And you, the, the thrill of that uh, uh, was just something special. And a lot of us got together, and it was my first time actually going to Stennis. I'd never been to Stennis before. I, I've seen pictures of the test stands and whatnot, but I'd never been on top of them. I decided I was going to make a little paper airplane just to see um, how it would stand up to uh, <laughs> flying off the top of the test stand. I really didn't tell anybody that I was doing it. Um, so who knows, I probably could have gotten a little bit of trouble doing that. But um, when I first got up there, I was uh, probably like anybody else. I was a little scared because uh, it's a little high up there. When nobody was looking <laughs> and I turned to the side, uh, went over there walking like I was looking at the trees and uh, trying to see uh, what else was out there. Um, I threw it. And uh, needless to say, um, because of the wind and everything, that paper airplane didn't fare so well. That's my little special story dealing with that. It's me. The controller software lab used to be in Canoga Park, California, Building 4. And in 1994, uh, there, were, uh, there was uh, a decision to bring the lab closer to the Marshall Space Flight Center customer. And there were a number of, of, of us working in Huntsville that were integrated with the Canoga Park team to facilitate that move. A crew of three of us, uh, Kevin and Bob and myself, uh, we moved the lab um, from Canoga Park over here, we, we spent a lot of days underneath the floor. I remember a funny story because uh, Bob, uh, we sent him underneath the floor and he would disappear. The only thing we could see was his feet. And then Kevin and I, when he needed to get out, we would pull him out by his feet out of the floor. Spent four days underneath a raised floor with about one foot of clearance. You know, I'd go underneath there at 8 o'clock and come out for lunch and dive back in there again pulling cables, you know, all kinds of stuff we found underneath there and packing it up and sending it to Huntsville. A lot of hard work went into that move and, uh, you know, we worked hard but we had a good time doing it. And I think we did it very well. Uh, and that makes me proud. I think the most fulfilling piece was watching the first fuel pump fly. I mean, but the LOX pump was exciting too, but I went up to the launch for the, uh, for the free first fuel pump. It was STS-104, I believe it was. And 
it was a 5 a.m. launch, so we all went up um, the night before, and we were lucky enough to take a family member with us, and I brought my son, who was five years old at the time, and we stayed up all night, and five o'clock in the morning is awfully early for a five-year-old, but he saw the shuttle launch, it lit up the sky, and he said, Dad, that, it looks like it's morning time, and then the shuttle left, it was dark again, but he, he was very excited seeing that launch, and that really gave me a lot of pride, not only in what I do, but for my family, too. One of our jobs here with the Project Support Group is to transfer files back and forth when the NASA customer needs data, whatever. Since we aren't compliant back and forth through our servers, we serve as that conduit. So Canoga Park will put, or West Palm, whichever, will put their charts in Flight Ops, which is a server that the SSME team uses. Myself, I have a folder. It's called Marcy. And over the years, that server's been set out there for years. And uh, all of our guys that I work with the, with the different product teams, you know, they know that that's where they're supposed to put the files. So at Canoga, we were sitting out there one day when I was visiting with a big group of turbo machinery people and a new guy came up that I had never seen before and he has this amazed look on his face like, wait a minute, Marcy as in the Marcy folder? He said, I thought that was not a real person. He said, I just thought that was a folder. I had no idea there was somebody who actually took care of that, that that was your folder. I think the strangest thing I've ever had to do on the program was actually non-concur with a change that I wrote. And the way that came down was when I was at the Cape, the engineers up here called me and told me that we had got an action from the program to change a requirement. Well, I immediately knew that whoever gave us the action did not even understand the test, so I told them that, that we can't do it, we can't complete that action. So I told him I would call back to the CM guy back in Houston and tell him that that action wasn't, you know, it needs to be withdrawn because it wasn't appropriate. So I called the JSC guy and he said they don't have a mechanism for withdrawing actions. And so he said my only option was to submit the change and if I didn't agree with it, non-concur, which I did. I wrote the change and it went through the change process. Then I wrote a non-concur to the change that I wrote. It went to the board and was rejected because we didn't concur with it and that closed the action and caused this twitch. <laughs> the shuttle is hugely important to the space program. The space program is one of America's crown jewels and the shuttle is the centerpiece of it. Uh, two things really stick out in my mind that, that I just absolutely love. Number one is seeing a launch. That's a very, very moving experience, and until you have experienced it, you can't really describe it. There's nothing really that prepares you for that experience. The other thing is, in my family, we like to look on the website for when the space station is going to pass over again. And I take my kids outside, and, and we look at the space station go by. And to see the brightest star in the night sky cross over, and you can tell your children that the people that you worked with helped put it there. That's uh, quite special, very, very gratifying. In October, I was at a supplier's, um, uh, it was one of his open house events, and I think it was a 20 year celebration. And it was the first time I was getting the opportunity to go and be with an astronaut, and the astronaut was uh, Robert Hoot Gibson. And, um, I remember it very well because I, when I showed up, I had a lot of anticipation of being able to meet him, talk to him, get to know him. And I remember that when I was introduced, we had a quick uh, little conversation. And then he said, well, I'll get back to you and talk to you later. Well, later never came because of the fact that we were so busy with the events and everything. So after everything was over, I went back to the hotel and I thought, geez, I would have loved to have talked to him. And shortly thereafter the phone rang and I picked it up and he said Lee and I said yeah he said this is Hoot, Hoot Gibson he says how about meet me downstairs in the lounge and let's have a couple beers 
And I thought, God, what a great thing to have happen. He showed me he's a real person. He was talking about his family, his goals in life, what he wanted. And I think from that I took the fact that this is really for the astronauts and we need to be very much aware of bringing them back safely for their families.